Well, yesterday was the first time in our new home that I was able to spend a good portion of the day working outside. And after several hours of various chores, backbreaking labor, and things, I was beginning to finish up the afternoon. And so I took a pair of hand trimmers or pruners, and I started to walk the edges of our yard. I began to cut back some briars and the weeds at the edges. Now, I know there are blades that I could get to put on my trimmer, my power trimmer, that would cut through all these things. So, brothers, if you're a yard enthusiast, I will take your advice later. But I needed to know what I was getting myself into before I got too carried away with whacking away at the bushes. You see, right at the edges of our yard, there's a steep bank into the neighbor's property. And over the years, the underbrush has slowly began to creep in, attempting to turn our yard back into forest. You see, it would have been significantly easier just to go whacking everything two inches from the ground. But that wasn't the objective yesterday. I needed to get an understanding. And it's a long, slow process of getting weeds out and clearing away briars so that the more favorable plants could grow. But this caused me to begin thinking about our passage this morning. You see, as Christians, we know what it's like for a long, slow battle with things that are deep-seated in our hearts, don't we? Things that take time to expunge from us in working out the wickedness that lies within each of us the Christian struggles. Just like briars on the hillside, evil in our hearts is persistent and rooted deep inside of us. And over the course of time, even when it is cut away and seemingly taken away, if left unattended, the briars begin to come back and destroy all the work that had been done. Just as Jesus was working so long ago in the hearts of his disciples, advancing the kingdom of God. He longs to work in our hearts. And I hope you'll pray with me that the Spirit of God this morning will open our hearts and our minds as we open the Word of God. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you that you are faithful and just and that you have given us your Word so that we might know you. You have revealed yourself through the Word and most clearly through Christ, your Son, who you've sent on our behalf, that we would walk in his grace and his mercy and receive his righteousness as he takes our unrighteousness away. Lord, we pray that you would move in our midst this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, in a way of short review, at the end of August, we took a break from our study in Mark in which we will be jumping back into today. In the month of September, we looked at discipleship. And now as we pick back up in Mark 7, in those first six chapters, we saw some major themes. First, that Jesus was bringing the kingdom of God to God's people. And the people were asking, what sort of man is this? And time and time again, the author points us to these questions and draws them to our attention and answers them in defending what he set out from the beginning. From the opening verses, the author makes it clear that he's attempting to display that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, and that is shown through the Old Testament and the works of Jesus. So today, we see that the Pharisees and scribes are reintroduced to our passage, back into the story. As we press forward to the Passion, and the climax of this story on the cross. So today we have three points to go along with. We will see hidden motivation, hypocrites revealed, and lastly, the hearts of fools. So first, we see hidden motivations. In chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, let me reread that to refresh your memories. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him, With some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw some of his disciples ate with their hands that were defiled, that is unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly. 
holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions they observe, such as the washing of cups, pots, and copper vessels, and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? Well, that would seem to be a reasonable question. Well, we first, let's consider who these people are. The Pharisees and the scribes, or the experts in the law, the the word scribes is simply that they would translate Late, they would transfer the word of God for the people. But that's what made them experts in the law. So that's a better way for us to understand who they were. They knew the word of God. They knew what it said. And they have come all the way from Jerusalem, assumingly coming to seek out this Jesus and to see what it is going on with him. He's been upsetting things, it sounds like. We saw how word had even come to King Herod in chapter 6 that the political authorities were taking note of him. Those in the elite class, the political, the religious, were all taking note of this Jesus and how he was upsetting things. He was upsetting the order in which they had established in their minds. And yet, they come and they cannot seemingly find a problem with Jesus because they do not address anything that he is doing. But they sneak around a back doorway of accusing Jesus by accusing his disciples. You see, as his disciples, they would be assuming that Jesus would be teaching them. And as their teacher... By accusing them of not following what they were supposed to be doing, they were making an accusation against Jesus. And so them challenging the disciples to their master about washing of hands and other traditions, it is challenging him and saying, what are you teaching these men? Why are you not teaching them correctly? And so we notice that Jesus, we should notice the premise of the question in verse 5. They assume that the tradition was keeping the law, whereas the tradition is intended to encourage law keeping. Let me say that again for you. The tra- they assume that tradition is keeping the law, whereas in reality, tradition is intended for encouraging law keeping. The tradition was established so that people would come and be clean and be encouraged into godliness. But the tradition was not in actually keeping the law of Moses. As we see, then Jesus goes on to expose the hypocrites that they are in verse 6 and following. And we see, first, what does Jesus say to them? And he says, And he said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it was written. This this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You see, they don't actually quote the law in their tradition. They are the teachings of of the elders or the fathers or the older people, the older generation. And you notice how Jesus doesn't actually critique that tradition. He doesn't say the tradition is wrong in and of itself, but what he says is that the people who are trying to enforce the tradition on others are failing because they are ignoring the law of God for the sake of their tradition. And you see, he tells them that you are leaving the commandment of God to hold to the traditions of men. And this would point us to what is it that Jesus is pointing to in Isaiah chapter 29, verses 13, that he is quoting from. 
Let me read to you the context of Isaiah 29, just briefly. And the vision of all this become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this. He says, I cannot read it, for it is sealed. And when they give the book to one who cannot read, saying, read this. He says, I cannot read. And the Lord said, Because this people draw near with their mouth and honor me with their lips, while their heart is far from me, and their fear of me is the commandment taught by men. You see, what God is saying here in Isaiah is that those who are trying to pay this lip service to God have an inability to read the word to understand, to comprehend the word. They have no ability. And this is in the greater context of the siege of Jerusalem, which is a time of judgment in their past. You see, God was punishing the Israelites for ignoring the commandments of God. They had gone away from the word of God despite the word and lip service that they paid to him. They would come and do all that they were supposed to according to their traditions, yet their hearts had abandoned God. And it led to idolatry and a time of judgment in their people. And this is the context in which Jesus is using in Mark chapter 7. And he's telling them that Not only was Isaiah writing about those people in Jerusalem, those Israelites, but he was writing about you, you Pharisees, you scribes, you who do not love the word of God, but love the commandments of men and the things that make you look holy in the eyes of people. You see... He continues on to give us an example. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother. Who reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father or mother, What you would have gained from me is corbain that is given to God. Then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or or mother. See here, we see that the word korban is a loan word. It's a word that has been transliterated from the Hebrew into the Greek into the English for us. And is a word that was set up as a word to say, I'm going to set this aside for God for later. And what Jesus is telling us is that people saw this loophole in the system And they said, well, I will set this aside for God so I don't need to do for you what I can today. And that is exactly why I believe he quotes the fifth commandment here. He quotes the fifth commandment as being to honor your father and mother. And not only does Jesus quote the commandment, but he reminds them of the consequences of rejecting that commandment. You see, whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. Some of us might begin to scratch our head and say, that seems a little severe, doesn't it? I mean, that's pretty harsh. What's so wrong with the home? The nursing home isn't that bad. The nurses are kind of nice. The food's not too bad, right? Well, in their time, in their day, there was no hurt nursing homes Friends, the nursing home was your children's home. There was not a place to go with professionals to take care of you. I'm not opposed to nursing homes, for the record. But there is a biblical command for children to attend and look after their family. Why? Because that is what God ordained. He gave us the command to love and honor those who he has placed in our lives. But why would he emphasize the fifth commandment? Well, I think 
This was intentional, not just because it was probably something that those people in front of him were struggling with or dealing with or simply not struggling with and doing without regard, but it is also the second half of the Ten Commandments. It's the beginning of the second table of the law in which God transitions from man's relationship to God to man's relationship to man. And you see, Jesus is beginning to point to us the things that he has told us elsewhere. We think particularly of Matthew chapters 5 and 7, where he digs into the law. And in Matthew's gospel, he shows us how the, the word of God is put into our hearts and how our sins do not come from our external doings, but from internal desires. And so this person-to-person relationship, it's much easier to look down upon your brother who has done you wrong than it is to God who has never done you wrong. Is it not? It's easy to get a chip on your shoulder from your neighbor who dirties your driveway with his leaves or grass clippings or plays his music too loud, whatever the case is. But God has done none of those things. He has given you Christ. He has shown you mercy and grace. So we won't easily, intentionally defile God, but our brother. We will hate our mother and father who perhaps have not been the best of parents. We will still have a grudge against them, will we not? So... We also see that parental relationships are foundational to life, are they not? As fathers and mothers, they begin to set up the beginnings of our relationships. They establish good and bad relationship patterns in our lives, do they not? I have talked with many of people who have not had good relationships with their parents, who have not had good parents, who their parents have done them injustice and done them wrong, and how they have struggled their entire lives to make corrections to those things. And dear friends, we should not push that off. We should not dissinuate that. We should not look down on them for that, but we should encourage them. And Dear friends, that's why we can look to a heavenly Father who has done us right, who has done us justice, who has done good for us. And so we've seen hidden motivation, hypocrites revealed, and now we turn to the hearts of fools. As Jesus continues in verse 14, he says, And he calls the people to him again and said to them, Hear me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that is going into him can defile him. But the things that come out of a person are what defile him. And when he had entered the house and left the people, his disciples asked him about the parable. And he said to them, Then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled? Let's pause right there. You see, first we see that Jesus gives understanding to the crowd in verses 14 and through 16. He calls all the people to him. And he explains to him what he is talking about. He um, gives understanding. And the word here for understanding is slightly different than he uses later in 18. This word here in, in verse 14 is one that reconciles two parties together. It's bringing into correlation these two seemingly conflicting things. And that's what Jesus is doing here for the entire crowd. He's bringing clarity to how these traditions are to be considered in relation to the law. 
And he's explaining, it's not what goes in you is as important as what is coming out of you. So there was obviously a confusion over what Jesus was teaching, and he needed to bring clarity. But you notice he doesn't address the Pharisees and the scribes. Remember what we talked about in Isaiah 29? They could not see. They were blind. They could not understand. They had spiritual blindness. And so he addresses the people, the people of God. And then, in verses 17 and following, he enters the house, and his disciples are confused too. And in verse 18, this is a slightly different word for understanding. It's one that is changing the mind. In many other places in the New Testament, it's translated as repent. He had to change the mind of his disciples. The same people that were being accused of violating the traditions, he still needed to change their minds. And so what does he do? In verse 18, he calls to them, are you also without understanding? Other translations, he simply calls them a fool or stupid. The NIV says dull. Uh, Personally, I prefer foolish. Because what I believe it does for us is it alludes to Proverbs. If we look in the book of Proverbs, we see that God sets up a dichotomy between two types of people. The people of God, those who are wise and the fool. And he he separates us into these two categories generally. And what eventually happens to the fool is that they become wicked. The progression from foolishness is to wickedness. You see, I think Jesus is pointing us to those ideas, showing us that if we follow the way of the fool, if we follow our traditions blindly and ignore what God has spoken clearly, it leads to wickedness. It leads to blatant sin. We see Jesus talking about the reality of eternity in the balance. He shows that our defilement is proven not by what we have done, but what spews forth from the heart of man. Because Romans 2.23 tells us what? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wicked heart produces evil. And he says, are you not so foolish that the things that go in your mouth simply are expelled from you? It is literally the word for sewer or latrine. They pass through your body. They don't defile you, but the things that come from you, the things that dwell within your heart, those are the things that have defiled you. And at the end, of this passage, what do we see? Verse 21, For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, and all these evil things come from within. They defile a person. Those are the things. Jesus doesn't grade them. He just starts listing things. All the things that come from the heart of man. This idea of foolishness is only used one other place in the New Testament. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. When Paul is speaking sarcastically about these super apostles that he is, oh, that he should weigh into the balance that he's not as good as them, yet he planted the church, yet he poured his life into them. Paul uses it in a sarcastic way about this idea of foolishness. And we see that Jesus here 
Calling his disciples a fool ends his list with foolishness. Hmm. So why is that important? Some seem that the external acts of a man determine how good they are. But Jesus tells us that it's not the external acts. Most of us can put on a good show for a Sunday or a Wednesday or a couple days out of the week when people are around. But the things that come from our hearts, the things that dwell within us, those are the things that are truly defining of us. As we spoke of, this comes to us again most clearly through Matthew chapters 5 and 7, where Christ shows us that the actions of man are produced from the evilness within our own hearts. So as we think through these things together this morning, and as these things lay on our hearts and our minds, let me give us some questions to encourage us to discuss, perhaps over lunch or this week, we will discuss them Wednesday night in our sermon discussion. First, how do we look to correct others in the body of Christ without having hidden motivation? How can we do that? Secondly, when do traditions lose their value? How do we maintain the significance of traditions? See, obviously, they had lost the significance of traditions in here the Pharisees and the scribes, because they were just simply looking to do them to look righteous. And lastly, how do we attempt to make loopholes in the law of God for ourselves? How too often have we done this in our own way? And if you're sitting here this morning... And perhaps you're feeling a little beat up from our passage today. Or just from a difficult week. Or a struggling morning. Where you have failed time and time again. Perhaps you've been holding on to tradition too tightly. Or you feel the reality of your hypocrisy because you've expected others to live up to the standard of your own righteousness that you cannot keep for yourselves. Well, dear friends, you've come to the right place. The church is not a place for perfect people to sit and cast stones at those sinners out there, but as a place for the hypocrites, the unwashed, those who have briars where there should be flowers. You see, this is the place for those that have evil hearts, And we come back week after week and turn to the God of heaven who condescended in the person of Jesus Christ so that we would not remain there in that place of unrighteousness, in that place of uncleanness, but that he would bring us into his kingdom and transfer us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And week after week, we turn together to the Word of God so that He would prune our hearts and dig up the evil that lives within us slowly, painstakingly, by the Spirit of God that works in all who believe and profess with their lips that Jesus Christ is Lord. We'll begin to turn our attention to the Lord's Supper shortly. And I would remind you that it is because of Christ that we can turn from our hypocrisy. We can repent and believe that we have been born from above. Just as Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 6, For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Are you weak this morning? Lean on the one who does not grow weary. Lean on Jesus. Have you turned from your sin this morning? Have you repented? Have you looked to the Christ who not only 
came down for us, but died for us, bled for us, so that we would be made whole again. Let us pray. Father, what a great gift you have given to us. For it has not cost us anything, but it has cost you greatly that Christ would come and die and forgive the sins of man so that we could know you, that we could be brought back into right relationship with you again. That we could hear the words of God and become alive. That we would read the words of God and know and understand by the Spirit of God that Christ is King, the Eternal One, from everlasting to everlasting. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.